On your left. Let Nameless go first. It's okay. No, because okay. I got... I didn't no, think I, I had a lot to, to say. To okay. I, have, I have something to do at the moment. Okay. That's different. And uh, to the chat and to the folks on the panel. Os. 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 <sighs> Os. Just trying to decide how I even want to begin. Begin this cut. I didn't think I had a lot to say about this, um, mainly because it seems like a pretty straightforward observation. Individuals that are exhibiting what we define as a metric of a pinnacle of success are demonstrating a trend with the way they're putting together their institution family. and. The more I think about it and the more I was listening to your points that you were making, Roger, the more I realized, you know, this is just still classic Red Pill 101 information that a lot of this space was founded on. And we're just seeing the inevitable conclusion of a, of a lot of this information, which is when you look at the reality of our scenario as individuals with this classification of Black, Black is not a culture. Black is an intellectual, social, complex, and an idea that takes on behavioral modalities that can be passed on from generation to generation to generation, a lot like how epigenetics works by definition. And we are contained within a greater cultural seed that is known as the American archetype. As a result, we're one of the only groups of people that are functioning almost exclusively within the modality of a subculture rather than having a impetus as a primary culture that brought us together here with a clear objective. That objective was not something that was self-actualized by our own volition and our own initiative. And it's only been recently that we've had any modicum of an opportunity to do that. A lot of the end results speak for themselves. To sum up what I'm saying in a nutshell with regards to that, black men and black women are an assigned group. So there's this very familiar trope that goes hashtag they were never our women. And I want that to play as a theme in the background as I continue what I'm saying, because that's relevant. I can't identify any other group in modern America that didn't stem from some cultural seed that intended to be here for the purpose of maintaining and building institutions, specifically starting with, and not to include and not to be limited by, the institution of family. As a result, since people recreate what it is they have from where they came from, one of the main issues we see is that from a cultural perspective, black women are not looking to be wives. They are looking to be mothers. The consequence of that is that men are not looking for partners. We're looking for somebody to fulfill a role. A wife isn't a partner. It's not something you get because you put a ring on somebody's finger it is a role that is to be performed with duties and responsibilities associated with it. And like any other role, it requires a measure of training and upbringing and examples to be initiated into that role to know what it is you need to perform and have the ability to problem solve when things don't go as intended. In other words, you need to come from an environment that was designed to teach you how to perform that role. Instead, what we have now 
in this modern era is a modality of partnership predicated on this idea of egalitarianism. This 50-50 post-industrial idea that two people can come together and form a partnership and role duties and responsibilities can be disseminated in some sort of equalized fashion that is neutral and down the middle and synergetic in a, in a way. I will say that very rarely does that ever play out and the research will show and prove over and over again that black men are the greatest cali or the best calibrated to perform in this kind of scenario. Here's some of the consequences of that. This right here was taken from the Supreme Court's website and it's citing a peer review, a peer review of interracial marriage in the United States in honor of the Supreme Court decision to allow for interracial marriages in the United States. I think it was the 1970s when Virginia finally greenlighted that and I believe they were the last state to do so. If you take a look at page two, you'll see the charts that show the differences between groups of people who marry out. And it's showing that overwhelmingly black men are more likely to marry out according to this chart and have as a result. And I want to recall what I said once more about what's going on with regards to roles. If we are coming from a cultural seed that doesn't honor that particular role, and even when the role was put in place, it was far more egalitarian. We need to understand that the overwhelming majority of black women by default, if they are set on course from what they've been socially conditioned to, to acclimate themselves to, they're not being trained to perform that role. So they are by virtue of that fact alone being disqualified, irrespective of what they look like, irrespective of what's between their thighs, irrespective of even some aspects of the behavior. They have not been trained to perform the role. That is the culture's responsibility. And it's the environment that fosters you and places you in a position to do that. Which again, as a result of our demographic uh, experience with regards to that has been largely abandoned in lieu of other modalities, specifically this 50-50 doctrine, which really doesn't really play out 50-50 when you, when you boil that down. And that may even warn its own video and I won't digress too much into that. But uh, I wanna give another resource here This is taken by uh, the National Library of Medicine, PubMed. I like using them as a resource. They're, a lot of the information is peer reviewed. Most of it's peer reviewed. And a lot of uh, a lot of the psychology fields borrow a lot of the statistics that are based here and they do a lot of good problem solving. But I wanna jump down to where it states the contemporary differences between black and white marriages here starts the median age at first marriage is roughly four years higher for black women than for white women 30 versus 26 respectively at all ages black americans display lower marriage rates than do other racial and ethnic groups got a chart that'll show below consequently far lower proportion of black women have married at least once by the age of 40. One more time. Consequently, far lower proportion of black women have married at least once by age 40. The tabulations of data from the U.S. Census Bureau of American Community Survey show that nearly nine out of 10 white Asian Pacific Islander women have never been married by, their, by the age of 40s, as has more than eight in 10 Hispanic women and more than three quarters of American Indian or Alaskan Native women. Yet fewer than two thirds of black women reported having married at least once by the same age. At least once. That's such a dramatic difference. A dramatic difference. To the point where it, it boils right back down to what we were saying before. We know that the rate at which black women have children is far higher than that. 
but the matter of being married is so much lower it's speaking to that point that within the Edo social complex there was greater value set on being a mother than being a wife and the common denominator between the two or the common pattern that I personally notice and here's my subjective opinion about it is that it doesn't take any training to become a mother that is a biological process of an action that takes place and a nine month period of gestation that is largely automatic that has nothing to do with that prefrontal cortex of that woman's brain all it has to do is to have certain events set in place and biologically they carry out automatically and you're a mother if if that process is allowed to, to reach its conclusion you're a mother whereas a wife requires a modality of training and an environment to foster that we don't have that here i'm going to add another resource here which gets into what i was saying and doubles down on this point this is taken from uh michigan law the michigan law firm I'm scrolling down to section six here, it says a first marriage. Starts off here. Perhaps the most important factor in the growth of the racial gap in marriage is the racial gap in the likelihood of ever marrying black women now marry at a lower rate than any other group of women. Historically, more than 95% of American women who have lived to age 15 at some point of their, at some point of their life, a, a, rate, a rate which has been declining since early 20th century by the mid 18 by the mid by the mid 1980s it's estimated that approximately 90 percent of adult women would ever marry so that was you know by the by the by the 80s this was going on so we're seeing now taken from the 80s moving forward the difference of what's happening here continues among black women the decline in the likelihood of ever marrying has been particularly dramatic while the estimated likelihood of ever marrying for white women has dropped from approximately 95 or more since the 1950s to about 90% for young women in the 1980s, the same likelihood of ever marrying for black women dropped during the same time period for an estimated 88% to somewhere between 70 to 75. Analysis of data from the 2000 census are consistent with these findings. Among women ages 40 through 44, 10% of white women and nearly 30% of black women have never married. To the extent that the women are unlikely to enter their first marriage at this stage in their life, these figures suggest that black women are nearly three times as likely as white women to never marry. I mean, there's so many sources on this that explain this and highlight this from a damn near anthropological perspective. There's clearly something going on within the culture. It's got nothing to do with what you look like. It's got nothing to do about black women or black men just wanting somebody else. It's got everything to do to the culture not being calibrated to fit the institution of two roles being filled in the context of husband and wife, but rather the modality of partnership in this egalitarian 50-50 mess that's really championed by modern feminism. And the end result is that men who want to build an institution are being put in a position to where they have to deal with women who have been trained to perform a specific role, which is the role of wife. Last exhibit I want to put here, and it's unfortunate they put this behind a paywall. But uh, I think the title speaks for itself. The gradual shift of wealth and power from African-American males to African-American females. And this is the ultimate consequence of what we see going on in the birth of a lot of, I'm going to call it pink pill philosophy. The understanding and the general trend that resources have been disproportionately placed in the hands of women for a very long time. And we know that the black power movement was usurped by the black female empowerment movement known also as intersectional feminism. The end result is the institutions that would create aspects of higher learning have become more hostile towards men and inhospitable for black men overall. 
then we've had to find alternative means and modalities to obtaining power to become to, to stay competitive it isn't that we want to don't want to be there it's just that again the culture has seen fit to prepare the women and leave the men out there to just fend for themselves and that's been a a pattern really ever since the reconstruction era and that can be argued but again this is a good book uh it breaks down a lot of that gradual shift that they were observing all the way back in 2005 and i can tell you now damn near 20 years later it's exasperated even further it's way worse now much much worse you can name institution after institution that's consisted primarily of all black women doing all kind of things i think they dedicated a flight was it here in houston in texas i think it was in i think it was in houston they've got a, a flight american airlines is dedicated all the staff including the flight attendants pilots all of that all black women you got houston also that has that uh court district all black women i mean you've there are modalities that are solidifying power exercising it against everything in this gynocratic undertone and the narrative surrounds it off the strength of okay well if they can do it why can't you followed by who gonna check me if you plant these seeds and you 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 empower the women at the expense of the men and continue to push the rhetoric that if you have black female liberation you get black people liberation the end result is ultimately those men that need institutions to help foster power because their husbands that need wives i.e people that need roles filled they're going to work with individuals that demonstrate the ability to stay qualified to perform the role and at this point with this boss bitch attitude this this gynocratic lead first by the feminine archetype at the expense of the men this is the end result and it's only going to exasperate worse and worse as time goes on but part of the consequence of that is what we're talking about today the the topic of discussion and a lot of the the in observations that are being made but these dudes who are in these apex positions of power they're looking for people who are qualified to perform the role it's got nothing to do with what you are what you look like or the fact that this chick is white or whatever she might be it's individuals qualified to perform the role because they have been brought up trained and integrated to do it can, there's a strong connection i'm just adding this and it's tied in there's a strong connection between the midwife role on the plantation that a lot of those mammies you're describing occupied and the role that the preacher used to have back in the day with regards to the balance of power between men and women and how that plays out into what you could argue is the true vestiges of african-american culture as it's understood as an archetype and a lot of the gynocratic modalities and what we did to get off the plantation has an interesting interplay between the two motivations behind these two concepts behind the preacher and the midwife I think that's probably worth really getting into and breaking down because we see a lot of these play out to this day. You know, why, why, the, and I'm digressing slightly with regards to that, like why the preacher was targeted and why they had to be left with BS. And we see the nonsense we see today versus the inevitable conclusion of what the Mammy Big Mama Big Shirley midwife produced as far as her affiliation with that white woman in the house and their conclusions that the black man was a potential problem that's all interrelated oh, you i had get no all idea that, man you all get I all saw, that together after you seen me put it up <laughs> yeah i mean i mean i don't get the privilege of just being able to say what i think i have to always validify and justify everything i'm saying nine times out of ten so but if i'm gonna offer something i want people to have something substantial so that they can present that to others if you know they end up being put on the spot that's how we shift this narrative you know we we have to take a different posture with the way we articulate these points so that we can develop a lexicon to describe it because if we don't then other people are going to use words that were never designed to describe this to to do it for us and it's not going to do us a service and it's going to do a disservice to this space overall because what i want to dispel is this idea that we're saying what we're saying because either one we're not trying hard enough 
or two, we've got some sort of inherent disdain for black women or black people. And that just fundamentally is false. It's not the case. And there's so many other issues that have gone into creating where we are now. And we're not the only ones talking about it. This has been talked about for decades by other groups of people with the, with the research and with the resources to point this out. Because contrary to popular belief, there is a desire to see our demographic be productive. The problem is because again, of the things that have been highlighted by things such as the Moynihan Report and the Kerner Commission, we don't have the cultural interface to result in the problem solving that's required. And I'll give one illustration, one example uh, before you know Hot Sauce jumps in. Um, it's the difference between someone being burned by heat and someone being burned by cold. The end result looks exactly the same. With third degree burns, you can lose a limb, you can cause infection. The same thing can happen with frost burn. You lose a hand, lose and gain, you know, all kinds of, all the negative things you can think of that occurs with the burn from ice can happen from fire. The difference and the key with regards to that is that the way you actually treat those injuries is night and day. If you use the treatment that you would utilize to actually heal a third degree burn on a frost burn, you're going to cause problems. The inverse is also true. If you apply more heat, which would help a, a frost burn to a third degree burn, you are going to exasperate the problem and make it even worse. As a result, if you don't understand the nuance and the difference, yes, we're all burned but we're burned from different sources and require a different modality of treatment to address. The problem we're having is twofold in that one, we're, we're not taking the time to identify those nuances, which is what we're trying to do in this space. And number two, the common burn from fire is the only set of resources and treatment that people are conditioned to apply. So when trying to actually solve the problem, nine times out of 10, they make it worse. And so the whole goal of us being in this space and why I bring these research uh, materials like that for people to utilize is so that they can distinguish the difference between the ice and the frost burn and begin to properly apply treatment in the spirit of problem solving. Because people still take complaints as though, or rather they take status reports as though they're complaints. And in reality, even though people are used to taking those status reports and complaining about it with no intention of doing something about it, that diagnosis is the first step to treatment. And you can only do that by having an accurate assessment of the symptoms and the point of origin of those symptoms so you can create a plan of action and treatment. And that's precisely the objective of a status report and why we need to continue to talk about these things again so that we can know the difference between that frost burn or that heat burn. So proper treatment can be administered. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and I got to get ready for work, though. But Roger, thanks for having me up and I'll be listening in the background.